legendary lighthouses, supported in part by a grant from Lighthouse Depot, your source for lighthouse collectibles, artwork, and decor, so that you may keep the legend alive. Lighthouse Depot store and catalog of Wells, Maine. And by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. They rose to take on the challenge of America's South Atlantic coast and became a cherished part of our landscape. It's a warm feeling to be coming in on a ferry and look over and see the light eyes, you know. It's the backdrop for everything. It's the light in the darkness directing you to safety. The lighthouse has sort of been a symbol, a monument to an age that will probably never be repeated or relived again. The legendary lighthouses of the South Atlantic. From the brisk waters off North Carolina to the sun-drenched Florida Keys, America's South Atlantic coast has long been a region of quiet retreat, serenity, and a refuge of tranquility. But not everything about this coast is kind. Today we take so much for granted with all the global positioning, sophisticated equipment, and we, we really don't understand and appreciate the inherent dangers of our coastline. And that is particularly true from North Carolina down to Key West. Geographically, one of the most notoriously dangerous areas along the eastern seaboard. And Marina had a lot of difficulty knowing where those dangers might be. In the darkness and in the storm, the light in the lighthouse itself became your salvation. Nowhere was warning needed more than along the outer banks of North Carolina, where the northern moving Gulf Stream and the southbound Labrador Current nearly collide. The violent clash of waters creates one of the most infamous of submerged hazards, Diamond Shoals. Over 500 ships have met their end on its sands, earning these waters the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The tide of destruction led to the building of the tallest and most famous lighthouse in America, Cape Hatteras Light. In a region with no high ground to perch on, the tower had to create its own height. Hatteras Light reaches skyward nearly 200 feet to cast its beam to the horizon. Creating this 19th century wonder was no easy task. This isn't your typical lighthouse. The early engineers had to figure out a way to make a tower that was 200 feet tall, able to withstand hurricane force winds, but was grounded in sand. As historian for the Outer Banks Historical Society, Tom Yoakum has studied the builder's innovative solution. They would create firm ground where there was none. The designer of this lighthouse dug a large hole and uh, he laid a series of yellow pine planks. Over top of that, they put on a lot of cut granite stone and that's what this entire 3,000 ton lighthouse rests upon. Having this light on top of a 200 foot tower allowed the beam to, to reach out to Diamond Shoals about 20 miles out. It's the fifth level. 
and 110 steps up. The early light keepers had to go up all 268 steps, so they had to carry two five gallon cans of kerosene. We're at the top of the 268 steps, about 175 feet above the beach here. It's a place called the watch room. This is where the light keeper would come and make sure that the mechanism which rotated the light was running the way it should. Okay, we're at the top. This is one of the two 1,000 watt bowls which currently powers the light. About the same intensity and, and distance that the original lighthouse had. This light was the, the pinnacle of technology when it was completed in 1870, and it's been able to withstand more than a, uh, 125 years of some of the most punishing weather that nature can dish up. Uh, and it's been able to do its job admirably, and it saved thousands and thousands of lives. The danger over which Hatteras Lighthouse broods also has its beauty. The barrier islands of the Outer Banks draw thousands of vacationers every year. But its treacherous nature remains. Reminders are never far away, lying just below the surface of the sea and land. I have no doubt that there are shipwrecks under all of these beachfront houses here. There's probably hardly a, a house up here that doesn't have a shipwreck in its basement. The wrecks are, are appearing and disappearing all the time. There were hundreds of wrecks all up and down these beaches because uh, there, there were no... Now here, this looks like the wreck right here. Lloyd Childers is a retired official with the State Historic Preservation Office. She's director of nearby Currituck Beach Lighthouse and an inveterate beachcomber for historic wrecks. This was the keel part. In other words, the beam that goes down the middle of the wreck. It could have been something like a two-masted schooner. What happened after the Civil War was that the, as industry began to build uh, in the north, they began to want to take advantage of the southern markets. And so they, uh, a tremendous amount of shipping uh, was occurring. What they did, they of course had the wonderful Hatteras light, but the next light up was Cape Henry, Virginia, and there was a tremendous dark spot between these two, and Currituck was one of the places that they chose to try to interrupt that darkness. This was was uh, a landmark for where they were and how close they were to Hatters. During the day, they could look up and they could see the the red brick lighthouse, and they knew that this was Currituck because it was the only one that was red brick. When completed in 1875, the Currituck Beach Lighthouse and the Keeper's Homes were the only buildings around for miles. Today, they support a museum where visitors can tour the grounds and climb the 163-foot tower. Inside, they get a glimpse at how the great industrial age came to lighthouses. Cast iron stairs that were factory built and brought by barge led to the most exquisite invention of lighthouse design. the French-made Fresnel lens. It threw a beam farther than ever before. In a place Lloyd Childers knows, mariners needed it most. I think it would be especially scary for a sailor in the darkness here. To hear the, the pounding of the surf, you can't tell where the shore is. You can't tell where the water begins and the and the, and the sand ends or, or the sky or whatever. So in the midst of that darkness, uh, if, if there's a beam of light from a lighthouse, that must have been a, a tremendous beacon of hope for them. Well, that must have been a, a, wonderful, a wonderful sight.
Some parts of the Outer Banks have been spared from development. Within the protected Cape Hatteras National Seashore, Body Island Lighthouse sits in surroundings almost unchanged from the 1930s. In those days, the family of Vernon Gaskill called the lighthouse home. Vernon walked the grounds not only as head lightkeeper, but as a hero to his children, especially his youngest son, John. We watched his ever uh, uh, duty that he performed. We would come up with him sometimes in the evening to light the light and uh, see, see all the things he had to do. I like to go up. It, it, it's always a pleasure for me to go up the tower. It's getting harder every year. It's a lot, a lot worse at 82 than 18. It was a good uh, childhood that I had here. It was boring at times, but we did have things to do. Our chores kept us busy part of the time, and our free time were fishing, boating, and beachcombing, things like that. In the inside of the lighthouse, we race all uh, going up, which we I never could run all the way to the top, but coming down it was very fast. Our feet only touched about four or five steps on each flight of stairs. We were in a kind of like a free fall, controlled we thought. The only thing I can remember of any importance was when my brother fell down the stairs and bit part of his tongue off. And that little piece was hanging, and Daddy took the scissors that he used to trim the torch and cut it off. Didn't affect his speech any, but he had a little less tongue than he had before. Every uh, keeper tried to keep his station up, especially when the lighthouse service had come by. And uh, usually we would know if an inspector was coming because the first lighthouse he hit, he'd send a word on down. Then everybody got busy. Everything had to be polished. Oh, my father didn't want us to clean the limbs, uh, mainly because we'd be in the way of him and his assistant. It was a special lens for lighthouses. We did know it come from uh, from France because of the sticker or the, the nameplate on the column that says Paris. My father being a lighthouse keeper, and my uncle and great uncle and great grandfather being lighthouse keeper. I assume I have it in my blood. But Coast Guard took over the lighthouse service in 1939. And that's when, uh, right after that, Daddy was transferred from here. And they never had a keeper here since then. Few places along the Outer Banks remain as isolated as Ocracoke Island. An enduring symbol of the village has stood since 1823, Ocracoke Lighthouse. It's one of the oldest active lights on the South Atlantic coast and a reassuring sight to generations of islanders. It's a warm feeling to be coming in on a ferry and look over and see the lighthouse, you know, and it's, uh, and it sort of greets you, you know, brings you home, a steady light, guides you right on the end. A member of one of the oldest families on the island, ferry pilot Rudy Austin sees the lighthouse as being as much a part of Ocracoke as the village itself. It's uh, probably one of the few lighthouses that's right in the community itself, you know. Most of them are either on the outskirts or on a hill or, you know, on a high spot somewhere else, you know. But this one's right in the community. This has been a major focal point of the community. All the kids used to play here when we were growing up. It's just sort of like a, a big playground to us, you know. When I was growing up here, there wasn't many lights around here. There wasn't any street lights. Yeah, it was the brightest thing around, sure was. It's sort of hard to 
explain what it feels like to have a lighthouse a part of your life. A resident since childhood, Christina Kurth owns a pottery shop. When I was 13 in the summer, uh, I lived in a house that was um, in the, depending on how you look at it, in the lighthouse's backyard. And uh, I lived in the upstairs bedroom, and the beam fell right uh, into, into the bedroom. A really clear, beautiful shaft of light. I'd stay up late at night and read by the lighthouse, you know, so, um, and write in my diary, 13, you know. It's the backdrop for everything. We used to walk the streets of Ocracoke, you know, the big social event of Saturday night. We'd start at the keeper's cottage um, and walk, come down around the loop, down point, and then back into the village. And of course, you wanted to hang out on the main drag as much as possible. Obviously, some of the older buildings have changed um, over time, um, but there's, there's fixed points in the landscape, and definitely the lighthouse. I mean, that's always been here. The lighthouse has a life on four sides of it, but you wouldn't really know that if you pulled in and looked up that long picket rail fence. It seems sort of uh, presented to you, but really there are three other sides to the lighthouse that uh, belong to the village, belong to the community. Certain things about the community have always remained the same. The lighthouse is one of those things. It helps you measure your life. <laughs> the lighthouse helps you measure your life. In preserving the past, few cities can match Charleston, South Carolina. Thousands of meticulously maintained homes stand as a tribute to Charleston's place as one of the wealthiest ports during the nation's first century. But nearby, a beloved structure that long drew the ships here awaits rescue. Morris Island Lighthouse. The sole survivor of an island that is today no more. A victim of the ever encroaching sea. The erosion has not erased memory of the island, nor the extraordinary day the tide suddenly came to take it away. We often discuss the, the, the tidal surge because we lost so much that was dear to us there. Gladys Myers Davis came to Morris Island with her father, a lightkeeper, and her family in 1933. Morris Island was lush, tropical, and really a, a paradise, really. It really was. It was a great place to live, great place to grow up. One thing about it, they knew where we were. My mom and dad, they didn't have to go hunt for us. They knew we weren't gonna get off the island. <laughs> I had been there so long, we didn't think there was any, any danger. We were not prepared for what happened. Because I can remember looking out the window upstairs. We had ironwork gates, and I remember telling my father, of course, I didn't know any different. To, to close the gate, the water was coming in. <laughs> it was part of an incoming tide, and once, once it started, then it continued a little bit more each day. Eventually, the walls crumbled. We lost everything we had, our um, German shepherd, wolf, and a little kitten that, that wolf used to carry around. and. Uh, my dad had his Model T, we lost that also. When we left there, I mean, you definitely could see that it was, it was a gradual thing, but it was gone. I mean, you knew what was gonna happen in the end. Having lived there, you can visualize what it was 
years ago and how much it meant to me and my family. Lighthouses have survived less subtle threats. The scars of one of the most brutal attacks of the Civil War pockmarked the walls of Fort Pulaski outside Savannah, Georgia. In the spring of 1862, after a two-day bombardment, Confederate troops surrendered the fort. They did more than save themselves. They also spared Cockspur Island Lighthouse. Caught between Union and Confederate forces, it emerged miraculously untouched. The abandoned tower survives as the rest of the world passes it by. Nearby Tybee Island has seen its share of change. Today, it's a weekend spot, as well as home to many looking to escape the city life of Savannah. They all come to know one particular outsized neighbor, the Tybee Island Lighthouse. One of the first of the great southern lighthouses, it has withstood the heat and salty air of coastal Georgia since 1867 but not without dedicated help. The uh, Tybee Lighthouse hadn't been painted in over 20 years, so as a result, we're gonna have to do some fairly extensive work to uh, bring it back to, to standards. Colin Chambers is a lighthouse preservationist. His goal is to have Tybee Light meet the strict codes of a century ago. If a district inspector were to come in today and find this lighthouse in the condition it's in, I, as the keeper, would be shot. I consider myself a historic preservationist whose focus his career on the restoration of lighthouses. The idea is to restore the lighthouse on Tybee to the way the keepers would have maintained it in its heyday. Cast iron is a great metal used in lighthouses, and uh, unfortunately, without the protective coatings, the paint to uh, protect it, it starts rusting. And so, one of the things we're going to have to do is sandblast the metal work and then recoat it. These are it's kind of like almost a vertebrae, if you will. They basically place these concentric rings over each other and literally work their way from the ground floor all the way up to the top of the lighthouse. Just about every brick lighthouse in America has cracks like this in it, but not this radical. What happened here is an earthquake of 1886 moved down the eastern seaboard and uh, caused a lot of structural damage to brick lighthouses. So we're basically just going to regrout this and then paint over it, and it won't be very discernible uh, after we get the coating on it. Last year we removed the flaking paint from the wall, and when we did that we discovered our earliest evidence of graffiti. And what it might have been was one of the workers here repairing the damage from the 1886 earthquake. Historically, all the interior spaces were painted white. And the idea was it would magnify the, the lantern light as they climbed these stairs at night. So one of the things we're going to do is take all this loose mortar off and then re-whitewash the inside of this lighthouse. This has got to be one of the most important and challenging parts of the, of the lighthouse restoration effort. Um, we have a first order for nailed lens. The Coast Guard currently requires that we insure this thing from anywhere from one to three million dollars, so it's an incredibly valuable artifact. We would have a real problem of replacing these prisms. That's one of the reasons we're so concerned with this damage on this focal plane. One of the first things we have to do before construction actually starts is protect this historic optic. I want to believe when we get it restored, it's going to pass inspection. That's part of my, my goal is to make sure this thing gleams again.
Among the barrier islands of Georgia, Sapelo Island seems lost in another century. Sapelo is, is a very isolated, remote island. The only access is by water. We have a, a ferry boat service that runs back and forth from the mainland twice a day. As reserve manager on Sapelo, Buddy Sullivan oversees a unique 16,000 acre island of marshes, woodlands, and abundant wildlife. We have a very large white-tailed deer herd on the island. We also have wild turkey, some wild hogs. We have uh, cattle uh, roaming at open range. We also have a tremendous amount of bird life on Sapelo. This is, uh, we're in the middle of a very active flyway. Of the island's many curiosities, none carries more mystique than a tower that has stood on the island's wooded shore since 1820, Sapelo Island Lighthouse. The lighthouse tower now has, has of course, been here for over 175 years, long unused and slowly decaying and going to ruin. It's been a somewhat of a romantic symbol of the bygone age of shipping at the south end of Sapelo Island. We got the idea several years ago that the lighthouse was certainly worth saving and, and definitely worth preserving. The state of Georgia undertook the challenge of repairing the lighthouse and brought together a team of architects and craftsmen. This has been a, a, an unusually tough job for the restoration effort. The men who've been on this job, I have found that they are really into what they're doing. They're excited about it, and they're very, very involved with the historical aspects of it. I think it's more than just a job to them. And I see where they're getting the roof. Yeah. The roof looks like it's going to be. Yeah, it's coming along. It's going to be great. We're getting there. People in this area are, are very in tune with what's happening here. They have a very strong sense of place. The lighthouse tower now has, has been used, even though it hasn't been an operating lighthouse, it's still a, a very important day mark for sport fishermen and commercial fishermen. You know, you learn very early in life by living in, in a section like this to, to get your feet muddy and, and tromp through the marshes and catch oysters and crabs. You get a rowboat and you get out on the, on the estuary and much of the history of Sapelo is associated with navigational history. It's the, the people have lived by the water, by the rivers and by the sea. Whenever I first started back in 78, I'd come up here and they showed me how to the George Trutt is a longtime shrimp and conch fisherman who has worked the waters off Sapelo for four decades. We go along here like this, when it drops off in a bee, we can turn and go right straight from my house and get right up on top of the beach. There's a slough in there, and then we can drag right down the slough. And that slough's been there for years. Most of the guys, they'll come out here and make a drag or two today, and they don't catch nothing, and they go back. You got to stick with it, and if you stick with it, you're going to, sooner or later, you're going to hit. The lighthouse, you know, it's hazy like it is today, we couldn't see it. But if they get it repainted, be bright, you'll be able to line it up better. It's been a challenge, it's been a very difficult job, but now we're at a point where the lighthouse is ready to be open to the public, and it will be a functioning light again, as well as the symbol, a monument to an age that will probably never be repeated or relived again. Just across the Florida border, Amelia Island Lighthouse finishes another night.
public access here is limited, except for civilians like Luisen of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Lighthouse work was never my background. Um, never, had a, never had a clue, but uh, I found it something that I, I really enjoy doing. Now, the flotilla members have, <laughs> have very affectionately nicknamed me Lighthouse Louie. The chance to be a part-time keeper came when the Coast Guard asked the auxiliary for assistance. Lou and the flotilla took on the job with relish. We decided that we would go as early as possible in the mornings. And, uh, and it's, it's very nice. You, you get up uh, pretty close to, to dawn and, and go up there and everything's quiet. No, one is, no one's up. It, it's fantastic. Bring my coffee, my newspaper, and uh, it's all mine. We climbed these massive uh, granite stone stairs and the first room we come to is what we call the machine room. This is the room that houses the, the drive mechanism uh, for turning the lens. That beautiful uh, set of prisms, that, that great big chandelier. Uh, we, uh, we have the necessary materials on hand uh, to, uh, to dust these prisms. And one of the rules we have uh, when we go up to, uh, to work on this thing is we shed all of our jewelry, particularly rings. The top of the lighthouse, uh, it, it's real therapy. I mean, you, f you forget all the problems of the week, you forget your job, you forget any problems around the house. You just, it is so absolutely serene. You just want to just stand there for, and, and take all of it you can get for as long as you can get. I've been very grateful uh, for, the, for this opportunity. It's, it's super to be able to take advantage of those things that, that come your way. For a very short period of time, you've got your own little wonderland. Farther down the Florida coast, another lighthouse has more than its share of visitors, over 130,000 a year. St. Augustine Lighthouse is one of the first lighthouses in the country to allow tourism. We used to run up. People were amazed, you know. As children of a keeper, Wilma Daniels Thompson and her brother Cracker lived a kid's fantasy. They were guides to a lighthouse. Well, we had come here in 1935 and I was only three years old, but I, I really enjoyed it because we had the beach and uh, the lighthouse to go up. Tourists in St. Augustine have been going on for years. Daddy being the head keeper, we had more advantages because we used to take the tourists up there and they'd give us a quarter or a dime and, well, a quarter you could go to the movies and buy popcorn and everything. Everybody liked Daddy. He was really a good father even though he was real busy. Well, he's just a tall, thin fella. Kept his weight down while running up and down the lighthouse. <laughs> you never see a, a fat lighthouse keeper. <laughs> there was five children, and uh, a Cracker was the oldest, and I was the baby. Some days we'd have five or six car loads come in, or and some days you wouldn't you have any. Well, this feels like home. Brings back memories. You forget a lot of things, but since we've been coming back here, a lot of things come back to me.
Not far from Daytona Beach, the past is alive and well at Ponce Inlet. A decades-long effort has restored almost every building that belongs to the Ponce de Leon Lighthouse. The second tallest lighthouse on the East Coast, it reaches 175 feet. It has almost all its original pieces, save one, its Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens was the essence of the lighthouse. Jim Dunlap is curator of the lighthouse. He heads a group of volunteers who work to restore lenses, including the Fresnel that used to sit in the tower outside. We couldn't really find anybody that had done a complete restoration of the lens. We uh, made a lot of phone calls, talked to a lot of experts, and more or less uh, learned by trial and error. I'm removing the glazing from the panels now, and uh, then we can take the, uh, the prisms out of the panels. Uh, when we get the prisms out, uh, then we'll, uh, do a, we'll catalog all the damage. The missing glass is a big problem because to uh, create a mold and actually do a production for one piece of glass is, is very, very expensive, and, and it's even hard to talk a glass maker into even attempting a process like that. The reason is simple. A 19th century Fresnel lens was as ingenious in its design as it was painstaking to make. The lens is actually an elaborate orchestration of an array of lenses and dozens of prisms. Each piece is molded, polished, and set precisely to redirect diffuse lamplight into a unified, far-reaching beam. Today, though the glass craftsmen are gone, other options may be on the horizon. One comes from volunteer Dan Spinella, an engineer with nearby Walt Disney World. I'm a mechanical designer, and I have no uh, previous experience in optics. Uh, I've seen a need at other lighthouses for replacing prisms also, and I was looking at a more cost-effective means of replacing those prisms. This is a first-order bullseye. Uh, it's damaged, and uh, it belongs to the uh, Ponce Inlet lens. This is one of the lenses that I needed to replace. The first step was to find a material that would look like glass and optically act like glass. And my choice was acrylic, because the index of refraction was identical to the crown glass that they used in the 1800s. This uh, was also cast uh, in a mold. Uh, the mold was machined according to uh, Fresnel's original formulas. Uh, the acrylic itself is formulated with a pigment in it to uh, replicate the greenish hue of the historic prism. And optically, this lens should operate exactly as the original. What I'd like to do is help any lighthouse that has uh, restoration needs with their lenses, uh, whether it be in a museum or in the uh, tower itself. The Lighthouse Museum has several Fresnels awaiting repair. Each lens has its own story. How one of them became damaged is an ironic footnote to the history of lighthouses. T minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. Go from eight engines. Start at six, five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia. As rockets put navigational satellites into the sky, they put lighthouses out of work. None suffered more directly than Cape Canaveral Lighthouse. The vibrations from rocket launches damaged the lens. It was removed in 1993. Cape Canaveral Light remains a monument to a time when the ocean was our boldest frontier.
Residents and vacationers alike lose themselves to the fun, sun, and surf of Southern Florida. But on the edge of Key Biscay, a lighthouse stands as a vestige from an era when this was no place to be lost. Since 1825, Cape Florida Lighthouse has marked the threshold of the most notorious region along the South Atlantic coast. The grounds are managed by the Florida Department of Parks and Recreation. The light's significance is the passion of local historian Joan Gill Blank. Cape Florida is really at the crossroads of history. Uh, whether you are heading here from South America, from the Caribbean islands, from Africa, uh, whether you're on your way northeast, uh, you have to pass by Cape Florida. The lighthouse system uh, decided to put a light on Cape Florida uh, so that the ships would know where they were uh, before they came to the dangerous Florida Reef where the pirates and the wreckers were waiting for them. And if they ran up on them, then uh, this was the end of the journey. The islands of the Florida Keys were a perfect haven for pirates, while the surrounding reefs served another kind of sea robber. Called wreckers, they presented themselves as salvagers of wrecked ships who saved passengers and precious goods. In reality, many were scavengers racing to enrich themselves on spilt cargo. Some even mimicked lighthouses, using lanterns to lure ships onto the reefs. To make this region safe for ships, a light needed to be directly on the reef. The designers settled on a screw pile structure. Most of your um, lighthouses anywhere else in the country are usually structured out of stone or, or brick or concrete um, with usually maybe the top part of it being metal which here they're all complete steel and their bases are, are made so that the sands can shift underneath them and they won't move. This is Sand Key Lighthouse. For bosun's mate Ray Potter, inspecting the reef lights is the highlight of being in the Coast Guard. I love getting out here. This is, this is part of my job, being a bosun's mate and, and being out on the water and being able to see the views out here, this is, this is excellent, you know, this is my life. I love coming out to the lighthouses, all of them. My original reasons for joining the Coast Guard is I wanted to be a lighthouse keeper. I, that was what I wanted to do, and when I came in, shortly after I um, went through my initial boot camp training and everything, they started closing most of the lighthouses, so they were dwindling very fast. This is the last opportunity to even get the deal with any of the lighthouses was to get into the aids to navigation. When we do do major work on the lights and stuff, we get to spend all day afternoon out of the different uh, reef lights. The structure itself is in very good condition. Um, like I said, there's a lot of abuse here um, from weather and such, but uh, as for its age and uh, construction, it's held up very, very well for, for the time that it's been here. Uh, all we're waiting for is the final fixing of the structure and the light will be up and we'll be relighting this light. This lighthouse will, will be shining its beacon once again. Six reef lights line the keys and they have now entered a new age. In 1990, this 3,500 square mile expanse of islands and precious coral became the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Spencer Slate runs Captain Slate's dive shop, 
He helped fight for the sanctuary and sees lights like Carey's Ford Reef Lighthouse as an integral part of his business and the survival of the reef itself. We are in the center of the uh, Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, which is the largest dive destination in the world. Over a million divers and snorkelers come to the Keys and Upper Keys a year. So most people all over the world have seen this lighthouse at one time or the other when they come here diving or snorkeling. Okay, air's on. Well, you just wait to step in when he comes up to the surface. Put your step, step to the right of the line. Put your hand on your mask. Regulator in your mouth. Okay. Big step. Big step. It's a beautiful sloping reef that comes out from under the lighthouse, then it gets out about where we're anchored and drops pretty, pretty rapidly into 70 feet of water. It's one of our favorite dives. The lighthouses mark very popular reefs areas because they were they're sitting on shallow reefs and that's where most of the pretty coral is. And the reason being, of course, to keep ships from running in the ground like they have over the centuries. And it also marks a nice place to come. Carysford Lighthouse has withstood over a century of corrosive salt air and countless storms. The Coast Guard and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration have refurbished the structure. But this is just the start of Carysford's transformation. Tom Pennycamp, whose father John led the push for the first state marine sanctuary here, is working to turn the former keeper's quarters into a modern marine lab. This is going to be a lot of work. There's no question about it. A lot of work's gone on already. Caris Fort Reef Light uh, up to about two years ago was really in, in bad shape. It had degenerated down. The, it wasn't safe. It was not a safe structure. The Coast Guard came out here and worked with us and also with the NOAA, and they put a lot of money into it about over the last, say, two years and brought it back structurally. Today it's as sound as it was the day it was built. And, uh, and it is really, it's going to be here long after I'm gone and a lot of other people. Coral reefs, uh, they have degenerated worldwide, but we don't understand why they get sick. And that's what we need the facility out here for. It will be the only offshore lab situated on water in the United States. To warn ships of shallow water instead of reefs and so on. All the, the lights up and down the coast, that's what they were for. But that's turned around now. What we really need is to save the reefs from the ships because the ships can navigate. The reef can't, the reef is here. No place benefited from the reefs more than Key West, where vigilant wreckers scouted the surrounding waters for foundering ships. The wrecking industry made this one of the richest ports in 19th century America. For generations, this has been a haven for outlaws, castaways, and eccentrics, and home to a light that holds a poignant place in lighthouse history. Key West Lighthouse. In the 1930s, a man named William Demerit was the last civilian keeper here. To museum director Joe Pace, he may also have been its most heroic. He was known as a little odd for the time, uh, very outspoken. Uh, he was smart enough uh, to know that the time of the lighthouse keeper was, was very short. And of course, he was correct. Franklin Delano Roosevelt reorganized the lighthouse service. And by 1939, uh, William DeMerritt realized that uh, he would lose his job here. And in a visit that Franklin D. Roosevelt did pay to the Florida Keys, he was being introduced uh, to a number of local dignitaries, and of course, William DeMerit was one of them, and he argued with the president concerning doing away with the lighthouse service. 
We have a great picture of the president. His face is contorted and he's letting uh, Demerit have it. And Demerit in the picture obviously just had words with the president of the United States and obviously those words were that you don't understand what you're doing, that you don't understand the tradition of the lighthouses. The picture is a favorite of lighthouse enthusiasts because that picture marks the last cry of, uh, of an independent breed in the very last spot of the United States that uh, was free. Key West is a very, very seductive place. People still come here because it's the last point, the end of the rainbow, the end of the road. And many people are attracted to that type of lifestyle. They're attracted to the tropics. But even today, you, you definitely have that feeling. The same type of people that are here today uh, I'm certain existed back then. I, you know, I think if you put a little scarf on uh, the head of a lot of people in this town, you've, you've got a pirate. People of Key West are very prideful uh, and independent people. Um, they enjoy their history here, a history of uh, various independent-minded people the history of the pirates, the history of the wreckers. That tradition of wrecking uh, is, is commemorated during April. One of the things that they do is uh, uh, have a wreckers, wreckers race. The annual Dash to Sand Key Light is organized by a local institution, Schooner Wharf Bar, and its co-owner, Evelina Worthington. It's a lot of the boats from Key West anything from Malta Halls to big old schooners to classic boats to smaller little dinghy type you know boats so it's it's a lot of fun it's for everybody to enter in the race and so you don't have to know anything about racing you just have to know where Sand Key Lighthouse is and go for it. As elsewhere, a lighthouse has become more than the far-off beacon of warning it was intended to be. People have made it a goal, a measure, a point of reference in their lives as they move across waters made safe by its beam long ago. Whether of steel, brick, or stone, the lighthouse is our universal memorial to the power of the sea. No matter how we find our way in the future, they hold an honored place along America's South Atlantic coast, where every evening, from the outer banks of North Carolina to the distant Florida Keys, they awaken. Their light, a reminder not only of where we are, but where we've been. A radiant fixture of hope that we sense will always be.
Legendary Lighthouses, supported in part by a grant from Lighthouse Depot, your source for lighthouse collectibles, artwork, and decor, so that you may keep the legend alive. Lighthouse Depot store and catalog of Wells, Maine. And by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. They were raised by the hundreds to light the treacherous reaches of the inland sea. Bold beacons of mortar, rock, and steel. The lighthouses are the castles of America. They are the timeless lighthouses of the Great Lakes. Back at Rocco Ages. There are more lighthouses here than on either sea coast. The five Great Lakes constitute one of the largest inland seas on the planet. They cover an area so large, they create their own weather patterns, known as lake effect. Lake Michigan and Lake Superior alone offer the visitor a rich variety of lighthouses and recreational opportunities. The offshore lighthouses that mark shoals and partially submerged rocks can be far from the nearest landfall. The romantic notion that we have of life on a lighthouse is vastly different from the way keepers actually existed on these remote stations. Rock of Ages Lighthouse is a forsaken outpost in the middle of Lake Superior. No one lives on the rock now. The automated light is maintained by the Coast Guard Aids to Navigation Team. On this inspection trip, a former inhabitant has come along to visit his old home. John Tregembo served as an assistant keeper here when he was an 18-year-old Coast Guardsman. Yep. Back at Rock O' Ages. The old song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. <laughs> Look at this place. 50 years ago, and I finally made landed on here again. The lighthouse was once home to four full-time keepers. The highly polished and tightly run station that John remembers is no longer. When the light was automated, the unnecessary equipment was removed. Years without caring occupants have taken their toll on the living quarters. <laughs> 50 years ago. <laughs> Y'all darn it. Whew. You had two clocks, Seth Thomas, and they had to be right on time. Then your radio was right over on that side over there. This we're walking into right now is what was a mess deck. We used to have refrigerator and stove were set up right here, and the sink was, I think this is where our sink was, right over in this area. Now, how many men were stationed here at one time? We, we had four men stationed at the lighthouse. So were there like four and one was away? One on compensatory absence all the time. Okay. And 21 days here, then seven days to go where you wished. But with the transportation that they had then, you didn't get very far. Now this next deck we're coming on to is where the bathtub set for the light. This, there's a great big mercury bathtub right in here. And that is what steadied the light. 
because uh, when the waves net hit the light, the light would be tilted. So by with this sitting in a, a tub of mercury, it just floated right here, and it always stayed level. Now you notice all these ventilators here. The reason for these ventilators is in the olden days they used acetylene gas. And uh, with that acetylene gas or the kerosene, they had to have it ventilated, so they'd open up these ventilators. The original lead crystal and brass lens at Rock of Ages was among the brightest on the lakes. It was replaced in 1985. The world of plastics, just one little piece of plastic like that replaced that beautiful second order Fresnel lens. This is a modern Coast Guard. Yeah, if you look down inside here, our primary lamps, the one in red, so if you look inside here, you can tell we're still the first lamp. Lamp changer, automatic lamp yeah, changer. That's a six place lamp changer. No brass to shine, no lens to polish. They got it made. Well, John, you can have the honor to turn on the popcorn. Well, this is sure easy compared to the olden days. There we go. See you in another 50 years. I know you'll be standing. I don't know about me. The light at Rock of Ages is one of four lighthouses that mark the Isle Royal chain in northern Lake Superior. Liz Valencia is Chief of Cultural Resources at Isle Royal National Park. I think lighthouses have special meanings in different ways for a lot of people. Some people are, are very interested in the lighthouse, the building itself, in the way it was built, where it was built, what shape it is, the design the light, the strength of the light, the size of the lens. They want to visit many different lighthouses, count the steps as they go to the top. Other people are more interested in, in the life of a light keeper, uh, how people lived at those remote places. How did they get their food? What did they do for fun? Uh, what did they do every day? How, how was their life different than, than the way we live now? The Rock Harbor Lighthouse once guided ships to the copper mines on Isle Royal. The lighthouse was dark for over a century. It's been rebuilt and has a new life as the home and protector of the island's maritime history. It's a great use for a structure like that. And it was a, an ideal place for a maritime history exhibit. It's right there uh, when you're standing in the lighthouse looking out, you're seeing the channel there, you know why that lighthouse was used. It's an ideal spot to bring in the maritime history of the island, to combine the, the lighthouse history with the history of shipwrecks and just the general history of Lake Superior and, and fog and wind and storms. And we've got lake charts in there and maps, whatever people might be interested in. Lake Erie, and that's Lake Erie, uh, Ontario. They must have been a very hardy, courageous bunch. <laughs> Everything is put in order. We leave this afternoon half froze. We close the light for the season on the 10th of November, 1886. So they said, do leave for the rest of the winter time. It's a, a way of life that's passed now. And if we don't preserve the lighthouses, if we don't get the information that we can from the light keepers that are still alive, We'll lose it, and it will be a chunk of our history that will be missing. So I think it's important to preserve not only the structure, but it's also important to preserve the stories and the feelings behind being a light keeper, because that makes the building come alive to me. Lighthouses were usually staffed by families. The lifestyle was difficult, but not without its rewards. Anne Bowen Hoag grew up on Passage Island, just off the eastern end of Isle Royal. Varen Bowen's choice of a career in the lighthouse service destined his family to a life of isolation on a small island, worlds away from the amenities of society. 
The island was fertile ground for the rich imagination of a child who remembers it fondly as a place of wonder and beauty. This was my special place in the house. So if I did something wrong, got set to my room, it was great. Because I'd sit in the window and I could watch out over the rocks and special places. And you know, not to have an education and not to go to school until I was 10, I never missed out on nothing. The education they taught me was very important. It was part of what I called home. And what you had here as a child was quality time with your parents, quality time. You know, learning to walk was learning to swim, learning safety, learning to respect Lake Superior. She's a lady. And when she gets mad and kicks up her heels, get in the safe court. Stay away from her. When she's calm, enjoy her, and she's beautiful. But respect her. I used to be a mountain goat when I was younger, but I guess the bones got old. You can see the beach. On days off, Dad brings us over here in the rowboat. We have a little picnic down there, and we play in the water that you see out there. We could play on the rocks, and it's a nice little place over there to swim, and just kind of explore. In a world without video games, computers, or television, Anne's playtime was enriched by a child's simple gift of imagination. This is the kitchen. You can see the stove. Just the right height. And if you notice, it's got burners. They're hot. That's the way the moss does it. It's got little shelves made that you can put your dishes, make leaves, salt, and peppers. But it was a play. This was my play stove here. It's been a lot of hours in this area. In fact, quite often, I'd leave my rag doll and my dishes in the area. Well, there's no more dishes to wash, and nobody plays here anymore. Well, see, being here wasn't a duty for my father and us. It was a way of life. You know, it was something we were all proud of because of him. Putting the flag up in the morning was very important. And, and we would come out and watch him when he did this. Mom and all of us came out. Well, I think I'll stay a long time. I think so, too. I think so, too. Thanks, Don. It doesn't take you much to take you back in time or to bring you forward. All around the island, there were little family fishing camps. Uh, almost every little harbor, every little bay had a, a family fishing camp with usually just a little cabin, a dock, a fish house, a net house, a couple of boats, and that's what they did. Uh, they came out kind of on the same cycle a lighthouse keeper did. Came out in the spring as soon as they could, slapped some paint on their boats, got them in the water, got their nets ready to go and they stayed out here and fished until November, December, whenever the lake made them go back. And it was a very interesting way of life. It was a hard way of life. Those people persisted out here. We have the cultural demonstration at the Edison Fishery, and we hire uh, a Park Service employee to fish down there. He talks about fishing, he catches fish, uses gill nets and all the equipment and gear that would have been used at the time period that Pete Edison would have been fishing at the fishery. 
it's just like it was, say, maybe 30s. It's about the same thing. And, and we do work on boats, as typical of the fishermen. He build his own boats, and they're wood boats, and uh, we fix our own engines, we fix our nets. It's a historic thing. These floats here, uh, these uh, fishermen made his, his own. A lot of these, he didn't order these, he could do them himself. And it was uh, soaked with oil, and so the penet uh, water wouldn't penetrate. And those were jobs that were done in the wintertime. Even mending nets was always done in the wintertime. And usually you bring the net right in your house. You'd be in the front room, would be a net in there, uh, scales and all, so, <laughs> and that's about all there is about fishing. The majestic Sand Hills Lighthouse marks the Keweenaw Peninsula on the southern shore of Lake Superior. It was once called the last word in lighthouse design because it is the last manned lighthouse, shore-based lighthouse built on the Great Lakes. It is also probably the largest lighthouse built on the Great Lakes in space. It's not the highest, but it is the largest. The three keeper dwelling, actually three lighthouse keepers and their families lived here. Bill Frabota is the proud keeper at Sand Hills today. I used to look at this bill when I first came and saw the beauty of it. It was, to me, it was like a castle. Uh, so maybe I was like a little boy playing castle. <laughs> I wanted something like this, a building I knew I could never build. The moment I saw Lake Superior, it was love at first sight. Uh, Lake Superior did it for me. Decided I had to be here. Then a few years later, let's say about 25 years ago, the bed and breakfast concept loomed on the horizon in this country, started getting really popular, really big. Then suddenly about 12 to 15 years ago, the interest in lighthouses started to mushroom. Putting those two things together gave me the perfect formula for a bed and breakfast. I knew that, I knew it would work. I think uh, people that go to bed and breakfast at inns like this are seeking a unique situation. Uh, they just, they're just wonderful people. I haven't had a bad guess yet. It's just uh, one that I wouldn't like to see come back. They're just thrilled to be here. The majesty of Lake Superior and the fact that they're in a lighthouse, I think it just uh, thrills them. We just happened to come by a sign that said lighthouse this way and we went and after that I was just I was just in love with him. I think a lighthouse is being cozy. Cozy. Well the histories of lighthouses <laughs> under the lighthouse keepers are fascinating. Mm -hmm. They've they really are. saved a lot of ships and lived a very private life. It's fun. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a lighthouse keeper but it's interesting to read about it and see about it. The lighthouses are the castles of America because they sit out on these strange peninsulas and places which people don't often visit and a lot of them are in disrepair and they're falling to pieces and um, people are curious about them and just interested in, in coming and seeing them and staying them and kind of experiencing it for themselves. Many of the lighthouses on the Great Lakes are rarely visited. The offshore lights that warn of shallow water or rocks and the island lighthouses can only be reached by boat or by aircraft. John Wagner is a pilot, photographer, and lover of lighthouses. Since 1958, he's logged over 8,000 hours in the air. Retired from his day job, he now combines his avocations, flying, photography, and the lighthouses of Michigan into a satisfying second career. John's book, Michigan Lighthouses, An Aerial Perspective, is the product of his imaginative blend of aviation and photography. 
a lot of people, I guess, are amazed at the fact that I fly the airplane and take pictures, too. I don't think too much of it. I sort of say it's like a one-man band. He sits there and, and uh, plays the piano keys and hums on a harmonica and beats the drum all at the same time. And I guess it's not too much different than the work he has to do. It uh, provides me this opportunity to uh, be more creative in combining of both more of an art forms than simply driving an airplane. The uh, camera I use for this is a Veronica GS1. It is a six by seven centimeter format. I added a gyroscopic stabilizer to the camera system and uh, that whole camera with the stabilizer weighs about 14 pounds. There's a great deal of time spent waiting for the right weather, particularly here in the Great Lakes. To get good images, there have to be a lot of things coming together. The right time of the year, uh, proper lighting, the season that I'm uh, trying to capture. Twenty-two islands make up the Apostle Island group at the western end of Lake Superior. Visitors are welcome at the island chain's six lighthouses. A voyage to Raspberry Island is a journey back in time. Hey kiddies, how you doing today? Welcome to Raspberry. How you doing folks? Hello. Well, I'll just gather up right here so that I can orient you to the island. It's not raining much and you're not made out of sugar. Matt Wilter, as lightkeeper Toots Winfield, performs an entertaining interpretive program that brings the history of the light station to life. Everybody come on up. <laughs> Gather around, folks. What you're looking at here is the Raspberry Island Lighthouse, built about 60 years ago, 1863. Originally, when there was fog here, the lighthouse keepers at Raspberry used to have to blow what was called a Gabriel's horn. They'd have to get a horn about so high and go like this. Do this with me. <laughs> a three second blast, once a minute, for as long as the fog held. Think you could do that all night long? No. <laughs> and if the boat kept coming, they'd get out a megaphone and they'd yell, Hey, you yahoo, you're gonna hit my island! <laughs> but later on we added this, 1903, this is our fog signal building here. But what happened was that the keeper that was there was just one keeper all by himself, a man named Charlie Hendrickson, and he had to run the thing the first night all by himself. Okay, so what I need you to do is uh, we're going to do three things. You've got to stoke the coals into the boiler, you've got to make sure to uh, blow the whistle, and you've got to make sure to watch the light. So I need you all to get nice big imaginary shovels. These big ones, heavy ones, okay? And we're gonna start shoveling coal, all right? Ready? Okay, now run upstairs, run upstairs, blow the whistle. Run back downstairs, stoke more coal. Run back upstairs, blow the whistle. Now run back downstairs, we're gonna do something different. Run outside. We gotta run up the tower now. Remember, the tower is a spiral staircase, so go around in circles. All right, check the light. It's still going. Okay, run back down the tower. Run back outside. Run back up the stairs. Blow the whistle. Run back downstairs. Stoke more coal. Now keep that up for about uh, three, four, five hours. <laughs> and that's what poor Charlie Hedrickson had to do. Interpretation, we try not to give out just facts to people because facts don't really say much. I can tell you that the lighthouse is 40 feet high or um, I can tell you that the lighthouse is, is 
high enough that if you fell off, you might break an arm or a leg. You know, which is going to stand in your mind more? All righty. This here is Mr. Benton's kitchen right here. Now, I bet you're all wondering why we don't have any furniture in here. Well, the first thing we do before we put any furniture in is we've got to make sure to varnish all the floors and whitewash every single wall. Now, let's see how high you can touch on the wall right here, Sonny. Go ahead and show me how high you can touch. All right, now see, if you were the keeper's son, you'd have to paint everything from here on down, all through the house, upstairs and down. And it's just because everybody helps out with the painting. Everybody, even the kitties. All righty. This here's the other thing that they bring us. This is a uh, roving lighthouse keeper's library. And this goes from lighthouse to lighthouse to lighthouse all around the islands. We go ahead and we get ours and we send it out to Devil's Islands about a month and a half from now and get a new one. And then Devil sends theirs to Outer and Outer sends theirs to Michigan. Come on up, folks. Use the Well, how do you like my lantern here, folks? I clean and polish this lantern so much, sometimes I think a genie's gonna pop out of the top. When I developed the character, I tried to choose a character that had virtually no background, virtually no living relatives. Um, that was sort of a ambiguous character. I didn't want, um, Anybody that, you know, if I was playing them, somebody's relative would come along and say, hey, you're playing my uncle or my uh, great-grandfather or something like that, and you're getting them all wrong. I wanted somebody who was obscure. And uh, fortunately, Toots Winfield, whose real name was Herbert Winfield, who was the lighthouse keeper for almost nine years here, he was just that. I think that people romanticize lighthouses in their minds. I've had several people that come out here say that they wish they could live out at a lighthouse. They want to hear about shipwrecks, and they want to hear about storms, and they want to hear about uh, lighthouses with ghosts in them for some strange reason. And uh, I, I think that in this day and age, it's really good to have something that isn't all high tech, that, that people still love. Devil's Island Light Station in the Apostle Islands provides an opportunity to experience lighthouse living. Volunteers carry on the time-honored rituals of lightkeepers during a magical summer-long assignment. This summer, Ed and Margaret Michon are in charge. This is Devil's Island Light 501. We have winds in the northwest at about seven knots. Waves are two to three feet at East Landing. The sky is clear. Temperature 57 degrees, 501. In our previous life, we were bureaucrats with the Department of Agriculture. We lived in Washington, D.C. and have lived there for many years, over 30 years. So there are, coming here is the complete antithesis of living in Washington, D.C. And I think that's one of the things that really attracted us to this place. And we're really surprised at how true it is, how very opposite this is of Washington. Of course, that, that's great. We love Washington, but we, we really love it here, too. I couldn't imagine how nice it was going to be. We'd been to the Apostles before. We knew what the area was like. We looked forward to it, but there's no way you can, in an abstract way, imagine how beautiful and how wonderful it is going to be. And it's been better than we ever thought. Hi, how are you? Welcome to Devil's Island. Where are you all from? Minneapolis. We get quite a few visitors coming through here to the park and visiting the lighthouse, so our job is to greet the visitors and show them the tower and tell them about the history of the place. And we found that the reaction of visitors to the park is uniformly favorable. People love it. Let's go over here to the light tower. There are light keepers at other, light, other stations who give us a hard time because our our light tower is just a steel tube sticking out of the ground. But it's, it's a nice steel tube and we sort of like it. The tube is 82 feet high, 8 feet in diameter, and we climb up 96 steps to get up to the top and show visitors the view. It's 
the only tower in the Apostles that still has the original glass Fresnel lens. This lens, when you put a kerosene lamp in it, which is what they used, would shine a light 18 miles over the lake. They used to light the lamp in here a half hour before sunset, and they would check to see when there was a half hour by putting four fingers between the horizon and the sun. And when the sun came down to within four fingers, just about time now, they would light the lamp. The first lighthouse in the Apostles, Michigan Island, was built in 1857. A beautiful stone tower with keeper's quarters. It was remarkably built in the wrong location. It was supposed to go on Long Island, 17 miles away. The practically useless light was only in service for a year. A taller tower that could be seen from all sides of the island was added later. That's why Michigan Island is graced with two light towers. I feel very strongly that if historic lighthouses are to survive, they need to still have a function. Don Terrace manages the Gross Point Lighthouse near Chicago. I think the obvious function for most lighthouses would be as interpretive tools, um, as kind of specialized maritime museums. The Gross Point Lighthouse was placed into service on March 1st, 1874. Lighthouses during this period did resemble each other to a certain extent. You might find an Italianate influence in the towers or the keeper's quarters. Architects would classify these buildings here as being Italianate in design. As originally envisioned, the site was going to be operated by a head keeper and an assistant keeper. The keeper's quarters is constructed as a bisymmetrical building. The principal keeper would live on one side and the assistant keeper would live on the other. It was known as a very desirable station. You had access to a fairly affluent community, very close to the city of Chicago. You were able to take advantage of the cultural resources. This was a very plush situation for a federal keeper to have. Gross Point Lighthouse is what's called a Lake Coastal Lighthouse. It acted as a signpost like a traffic light guiding ships into Chicago Harbor. Ships heading for Chicago would first head to Gross Point, the most natural landmark north of the city, and they would then follow the shoreline into Chicago's port. And it made this association between Gross Point Lighthouse and the Chicago Harbor Lighthouse working in tandem very, very important. The late 1800s were the heyday for building lighthouses on the Great Lakes. The building boom paralleled the growth of commerce in the region. Chicago Harbor was one of the busiest ports in the country. It rivaled New York and San Francisco. Tall masted schooners carried grain to the cities in the east and returned with timber and supplies for the country's expansion westward. Time has put a new face on Chicago Harbor. The lighthouse now marks the river mouth for pleasure boats. The waterfront has a new look. Once a busy loading dock, the North Pier is an upscale boardwalk and a lively place to visit. The ships that carry cargo on the lakes today are massive. 
thousand foot long ore carriers are the pride of the fleet. Minnesota's Duluth Harbor is one of the busiest ports on Lake Superior. Ships destined for cities to the east arrive empty to collect their cargoes of iron ore, grain, or coal. The Masabi miner is loaded with iron ore. She's headed east for Nanakoke, Ontario. The one-way trip will take three days. It's midsummer and perfect weather for the crews. Even when all's well, Captain Timothy Dayton maintains a healthy respect for the largest of the Great Lakes. Well, when we get out in the middle, we can't see from one side to the other. It's 360 miles from Duluth to Whitefish Point. The lake is wide, the lake is deep, and it's cold all the time. It's a big body of water. We have uh, several different electronic systems that we use for navigation and also collision avoidance. The first is radar. The second, we have a Loran C receiver. And the latest that we have had is the uh, GPS system, and these are replacing traditional navigation methods of old. So really, lighthouses' importance to the commercial mariner on a ship have decreased greatly over the years. Okay, this is our location right now, this circle in the center of the screen. This is our route. We started in Duluth, went past Devils Island, on our way to Eagle and Copper Harbor. We should see Standard Rock, which is on the east half of the lake, Caribou Island, and finally we'll see Whitefish Point. We still use the paper charts. They're still required item in our inventory. And I like to see that the officers on the watch put a uh, position on the chart about once a half hour. Any one time any of this electronic equipment could go out or fail. Lighthouses are there. When you see the light that you know is your home harbor and it's flashing in the distance, you know you've made it. So lighthouses still, for the mariner, they still have a reassuring sense that, yes, there's actually land out there at the end of this water. One ship that was notorious for not reaching the land at the end of the water was the Edmund Fitzgerald. When the Fitzgerald was christened in 1958, she was considered the queen of the Great Lakes. At 730 feet, she was the biggest and the fastest ship in the fleet. Like the Titanic, she was believed to be unsinkable. November 9, 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald left Duluth, Minnesota, loaded with iron ore. The trip began under fair skies. The forecast indicated that a winter storm was fast approaching. The captain of the Fitzgerald, Ernest McSorley, was well seasoned, and foul weather would not keep the Fitzgerald at port. With the wind and seas building, McSorley chose a course along the north shore of Lake Superior. He evidently hoped that the land would offer protection from the increasing wind and waves. According to what I've read, they had anywhere from 30 to 35 foot seas running. So they had quite a large sea. Uh, wind knots were 70, 80 knots. If this was down in the tropics, it would be considered a hurricane type uh, force of the storm. But up here, we don't get hurricanes. Uh, we just get nasty storms. The Fitzgerald continued on. What happened next remains a mystery. It's widely believed that wind and waves alone did not sink the great ship. The vessel should not have sunk. If the bottom line is that vessel should have been able to handle that, that storm and should have not have sunk. So I think he touched bottom, pulled his tank, and it was a slow process of slowly loading the vessel down with more water. And I think what happened is he got one large sea rolling up the deck and he just submarined. I'm sure they were standing in the pilot house waiting for her to come back from that last wave that went by, and she didn't. She didn't. 
Sometime during the night of November 10th, 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald and her entire crew were lost. The wreck of the Fitzgerald lies just offshore from the light station at Whitefish Point and the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. The ship's bell, recovered from the wreck of the Fitzgerald, is the centerpiece of the museum. Museum director Tom Farnquist was instrumental in the recovery of the bell. Family members who lost loved ones aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald asked if we wouldn't return to the vessel to bring up an object that would really represent what the Fitzgerald uh, was about. And there was only one object I could think of, that was the bell that had the name engraved on it. We established this uh, museum with the intent to share with uh, those that can't dive to shipwrecks the excitement, the adventure of diving, and also to remember the sailors that were lost. It's the perfect spot for a shipwreck museum because the fact that we're located on site of some of the worst tragedies uh, on Great Lakes along the shipwreck coast. The first lighthouse was built here in 1849. It was uh, built of stone and concrete and it was replaced in 1861 with the present structure. It's an 80 foot tall iron skeletal tower. This tower surprises a lot of people. They'll take a look at it and they'll see this, uh, this metal structure that's uh, fairly well engineered. It went together like an erector set, but it was designed back in the 1860s and uh, was completed in 1861. We found that Whitefish was probably the most historically significant light station on Lake Superior, being the first one established way back in 1849. Through time, I think we've uh, put together what we consider a world-class interpretive center here at Whitefish. The Old World charm of Mackinac Island in western Lake Huron has drawn tourists to its shores for over a century. Little has changed here over the years. A ban on cars adds to the amiable pace of the island and keeps visitors returning. Historian Phil Porter. Mackinac Island has been a tourist destination for uh, well over a century. And it began after the Civil War as people began to come here as a result of a desire to escape. People across the country looked for summer places and Mackinac was a natural because it has natural beauty, historic charm, and a very healthy environment which is one of the things people were looking for in their summer places after the Civil War. From the sweeping porch of the Grand Hotel, the view of Round Island Lighthouse offers another reminder of the past. Round Island Lighthouse was built in 1896 to mark the channel for commercial ships passing through the Straits of Mackinac. It also guided private yachts into Mackinac Island. Once home to three full-time keepers, the light at Round Island was decommissioned by the Coast Guard in 1947. Years of neglect took their toll. The foundation washed away, and the Round Island light was in danger of crumbling into the lake. Through community effort, the structure was saved. Restoration of the lighthouse is an ongoing project. Dick Mole is the president of the Great Lakes Light Keepers Association. He's a driving force in the movement to save Great Lakes lighthouses. Today, he's coordinating a party of willing workers from Boy Scout Troop 323 in Freeland, Michigan. This is the Scout Troop's third season of work on Round Island. Today, uh, we've got a small amount of cleanup work to do. We've got to pour some cement pads underneath the privy and uh, put a jack in place, okay? One, two, three. Where's the crowbar? We're supposed to lift up, guys. Okay, who's got the crowbar? The ongoing work at Round Island is truly a labor of love. 
Each job completed is its own reward. Dick Mole has saved several lighthouses. His example has inspired others to work for lighthouse preservation. One of the things that overwhelms people, you look at the whole thing and you say, it can't be done. But as soon as you say, let's do one room at a time or one inch at a time, then all of a sudden it becomes manageable and you have your head screwed on right and, and you can really accomplish it that way. Ready? And the thing that's really sort of exciting about it is that working with young people or working with people in a project, it's sort of like a Huck Finn experience. Uh, we all have fun doing it. One, two, three, set. Well, it's a, a lot of pride going into this. A lot of work, a lot of manpower. You should have seen it before upstairs. Looks like somebody broke in and had a six week party. A lot of trash. The privy was laying down also, and that's standing up now. One day we probably hauled each 2,000 pounds of stones. Dale Gensman's father helped build the Round Island Lighthouse in 1895. For Dale, the restoration honors his father's craftsmanship. This is a sunburst on a null pole. The sunburst was a manufactured part of the carpenter's life. He left a little bit of something in everything that he did. If people are going to come over here and visit, they're entitled to see how it originally looked. It's going to look like the day that it was first put in here. It's all oak. It should finish up very nicely. The preservation of the Round Island Lighthouse is really a, a, an excellent example of a different partnerships working together to achieve uh, a worthwhile goal. It's really the volunteer spirit and seeing everybody work together and rowing the boat, so to speak, uh, really works. Do they do the candle in there? They... You mean, do we still light the lighthouse? Yeah. It was shut down about 28 years ago, so it's not used as a working lighthouse anymore, but we do every once in a while, like about once every two weeks or so, we light the light just to show folks what it used to look like when it was still working. Okay, sure. The lighthouse perched high on the cliff has drawn visitors to Split Rock in Minnesota since the 1920s, and they're still coming. Today, visitors can learn the history of Split Rock Lighthouse from the ground up. The greatest challenge to the builders of the lighthouse at Split Rock was getting men and materials to the site. To bring a ship in here, actually a 35-foot boat that would bring in the supplies from Duluth, they had to make sure the weather was going to be calm enough to unload, first of all and they had to make sure that they were gonna be able to make it back to Duluth, a 45, 50 mile round trip to get another load of supplies. The supply boat was stationed at the base of the cliff. A derrick lifted the materials for 10 buildings up to the construction site. Lee Radzik manages the site today. It's amazing the construction uh, quality and the workmanship that did go into these buildings considering the, the tough and, and rugged conditions they had to build under. It's not like running back to the hardware store if you need another piece of equipment. A parade of carpenters, bricklayers, and steel workers who earned an average of 35 cents an hour worked through November. They returned the following spring to finish the job. The cost for the entire 10 building light station was $72,000. The Fresnel lens, imported from France, was the crowning jewel of the light station at Split Rock. This is considered a third order bivalve lens or clamshell lens, which is different than the, the beehive or circular type lenses. There's uh, 252 different lens panels in it, uh, counting both sides of it. The whole revolving apparatus is four and a half tons. It's massive. The clockwork mechanism that rotates the lens is one of only a handful that still work. 
Well, it's basically like a grandfather's clock or cuckoo clock where a series of weights, in this case 250 pounds of weight that are attached to a cable, unwind down a column that runs all the way down the center of the lighthouse. And as those weights drop, in this case 40 feet, it'll revolve the lens. And that's one reason why keepers had to be on duty all the time, was to make sure that the light was running on time, that the clockwork was running on time, uh, that the weights were wound up and hadn't dropped to the bottom. I've heard stories of keepers sleeping underneath the bottom of the weights so that if the weights came down and touched them, they'd uh, realize it and wake up and wind the weights again. Part of their job was to use the crank and every uh, two hours, put about 150 cranks onto the clockwork and bring those weights back up. Wind that cable up on the spool and keep the gears running and the lens turning and that light shining on a constant rotation out on the lake. The Grand Travers Lighthouse enjoys a second life under the care of a special keeper. David McCormick grew up here and has come back to reopen the lighthouse. Yeah, I grew up here. Uh, I came here when I was uh, nine years old, 1922. Uh, this was no, uh, no electricity, all kerosene. What's the history of this old building? Well, this building uh, was built in 1858. It was a one-man station then, and they made a two-man station when they put the fog signal in. And originally, the front door was over on the west side of the building. I want to show you the, here's the bathtub here. Once again, Dave's home, the Grand Traverse Light is open to visitors. The house is filled with family treasures. Dave's stories bring the rooms to life. And then you had, we had uh, two pair of underwear, long johns. One was in the wash and you had one on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you changed them every Saturday. <laughs> Whether you needed to or not. You're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> This organ has quite a history. Uh, my mother got that in 1899 at the turn of the century when my father gave it to her as a wedding present. And we had a regular uh, sing-along here, oh, a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. When she'd play the organ or the concertina, my father played a zither or that square thing. I played a harmonica and I had a brother played the guitar had three sisters, that really good singers. That's, that's my father there. Uh, my father used to sit over there and play uh, cribbage, solitary cribbage. And we had a, an old 1924 Atwater Kent uh, radio that's out in the back room with three dials on it. That's where I first learned about the Green Bay Packers. You had this Victrola back in the days when you were here, or is, this, is that newer vintage than that? This. Well, we had, that's what we had. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that. If the, if the spring broke, we'd come up here and we'd turn it with our finger. It's trouble finding uh, needles for them. Not exactly high fidelity, but. <laughs> but cool. But it worked. It was a happy time, a family time. Once a crucial part of lake navigation, the lighthouses have outlived their original intent. The lighthouses of the Great Lakes have had many caretakers. First, the original lighthouse service, then the Coast Guard, and now the parks, historical societies, and private owners. Once a crucial part of lake navigation, the lighthouses have outlived their need, but most are heading into a happy retirement with a renewed purpose. The lighthouses of the Inland Sea are more than historic monuments. Perhaps we see a deeper value in what these buildings stood for, a light in the night marking the way.
Legendary Lighthouses, supported in part by a grant from Lighthouse Depot, your source for lighthouse collectibles, artwork, and decor, so that you may keep the legend alive. Lighthouse Depot store and catalog of Wells, Maine. And by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. This is PBS.